Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Vishal Gewali from Queen's University, Kingston, Canada. It's my big pleasure and honor today to be speaking at this eCancer conference about communication skills, which I believe is one of the most important skills for a medical oncologist. I have no relevant disclosures related to this talk. So why, why are communication skills important in oncology? So, you know, as a physician, we may be seeing so many patients in a day, but whatever we tell to the patient has, has big impact because it is one of the 100 patients for us, but for the given patient, we are the doctor. They will remember the doctor, the day, the moment when the cancer was diagnosed or when we gave some bad news or even good news. So it is important and patients will never forget about it. That's why we have to do it well. Each casual word that we have said will be recorded forever in their memories. And one thing that we need to remember is when we are talking about communication skills, it's not just about talking or relaying information. It's also about listening, which is an important part of communication, uh, which provides validation and reassurance to the patient and other patient's party. And the other thing to remember is communication skills are important not only for delivering bad news, but even delivering good news requires skills. You don't want to over-exaggerate the good news. And it has been shown empirically through studies that communication skills uh, are related to quality of care, patient satisfaction, and even professional well-being. So the big question will be, can these communication skills be taught and trained? Or is it something that's inherent in the physician and you can do nothing about it? So yes, there is a saying that a bad human being cannot be a good doctor, but uh, the question is, can you train someone to be a good human being? But, or more importantly, good human beings may not necessarily be good communicators. So can you teach or train good doctors to also be good communicators? And the answer is yes. There have been several studies that show uh, without a doubt that giving training on communication skills improves the physician's communication skills and also improves patient satisfaction. As I mentioned earlier, communication skills does not necessarily mean breaking bad news alone uh, because there are several important junctures in a patient with cancer's journey uh, that are important from communication point of view. For example, the first visit where we talk about the diagnosis, the prognosis, the treatment options, the first visit with a medical oncologist. That's one of the biggest junctures uh, in the journey of a cancer patient. And that is one of the visits that will be remembered forever. And this is one of those visits where communication has to be done very correctly and accurately with empathy. Then whenever we are discussing the results of a scan, response assessment scan, there is disease progression or there is a stable disease or there is uh, treatment response, the communication of the results of the scan, communication of the results of the blood work, various side effects, toxicities, the need to make those decisions about chemotherapy. Should we delay this chemo? Should we skip treatment? Reduce the dose? And more importantly, whenever we are offering any new treatment, the risks and benefits assessment of those interventions. And these are not easy uh, because there is so much of uncertainty in what we do. Most of the things that we do are not black and white. Uh, they are more of a shade of gray. And therefore, this communication of uncertainty is one of the difficult uh, jobs as a medical oncologist. And there was one famous essay um, called The Median is Not the Message, written by Stephen J. Gould after he was diagnosed with abdominal mesothelioma. And he read about the median survival times. Um, but he lived far beyond the median survival time. And this was his uh, message that the median is not the take home point. So how do we communicate the survival times to the patients? Should we cite the median um, survival times that are quoted in the trials? If median is not the message, is what, what should be our metric? Median is not the message, but neither is the mean, nor is the hazard ratio. How do we make patients understand those uncertainties? There have been several studies that looked at physician survival predictions in patients with terminally ill cancers. And studies have consistently shown that we physicians overestimate survival. We are a little more optimistic. The other study in lung cancer also shows that all clinicians overestimated patient survival time. 
a more recent study from 2020 in patients with head and neck cancer again leads to the same conclusion physicians overestimate the survival but it's difficult because we have to make predictions based on so many levels of surrogacy we have to make a prediction for the survival of the patient in front of us based on what we know is the survival in the population which is a surrogate based on what we see survival in phase three clinical trials which is also a surrogate based on what we because many trials don't even report overall survival so we guess it based on pfs in the phase three trials sometimes they don't even mention pfs so we guess it based on response rates which is also not available sometimes so we base it based on observational data so this whole surrogacy cascade makes it very difficult for us to accurately predict survival for a given patient in a given situation but I think one of the most accurate statements that we as oncologists can say is, I don't know. But it's also a hard thing to say. And it's not easy for uh, the physician to accept this as well, for, for the patient to accept this as well. So we can come up with a range of probabilities, but we'll never know the exact survival or make exact uh, predictions for a given patient. We can always discuss the range of possibilities, the worst case scenario, the best case scenario. We can discuss the level of evidence, solid evidence, low level evidence, magnitude of benefit, probably substantial benefit versus marginal benefit. And we can also discuss how much information to relay for the patient, for the patient's family, which depends on the cultural context um, about whether paternalism is uh, more important versus uh, patient autonomy. So this depends on culture and context. But some common sense communication tips is to understand that relative risk reductions are, are deceptive. For example, even if uh, someone says there is a 90% risk reduction, that means nothing if the baseline risk is very small to begin with. And we should always consider the denominator. Um, even if we say that the risk of serious adverse event is only 0.5%, uh, but if millions and millions of patients are getting the intervention, then that 0.5% can turn out to be a huge number. So just to give a real life example, let's say there is a patient who comes with an elevated PSA on routine screening tests. And the question is, doctor, should I undergo a prostate biopsy? There will be no easy answer here. There are so many things to consider. What are the possible range of chances that an elevated PSA at the given age may be a cancer? What are the range of chances that that cancer will actually kill the patient if it were a cancer? What are the chances that the treatment may help in reducing that risk? What are the chances that there will be various side effects from the whole process? And all these range of estimates should be considered before making an informed decision. There will not be a single correct answer. So let's talk a little bit more detail about breaking bad news, which is an important aspect of what we do every day. So the tax of breaking bad news is very important because as Robert Buckman says, if we do it badly, the patients or family members may never forgive us. If we do it well, they will never forget us. And there have been various guidelines uh, proposed about how to deliver bad news correctly. One of the most commonly used is the spikes protocol. And nowadays in the era of COVID and virtual teleconsultations, uh, there, is, there was also a new paper suggesting we should use a newer framework, wire spikes. Uh, for telephone or, or video conference, wire is standing for what technology is preferred, identifying members and environment, repeatedly uh, checking in and extending time for pauses, questions and descriptions. But uh, an important aspect of all of these uh, tools or guidelines is uh, I think the, the physicians would uh, understand or empathize with the patient and do as if he or she wishes it to be done upon him or her if he or she were the patient. Uh, and I had written a series of articles about this in Medscape uh, about my personal experience with breaking bad news to cancer patients around the world. Uh, I practiced in Nepal, Japan, and now in Canada. Uh, so these cultural differences matters a lot. Not all patients come from the same cultural background. So we have to take that into account when delivering bad news. And similarly, uh, the other important aspect is about how much to delve into patient's personal matter uh, um, for delivering cancer care. Um, that's life that are worse than death for a given patient, but we won't know about it unless we ask about it. And again, in the context of the pandemic, how to deliver bad news via telephone or, or 
Zoom or any teleconsultation. It's not the same as meeting someone face to face. And in the end of all of this conversation is uh, about dying and how to communicate that news about dying. I think quality of life to death transition is an important metric that we uh, keep ignoring in our practice. There have been multiple studies showing that even patients with good performance status, they do poorly in terms of life death transition if they are given chemotherapy until the very end of their life. We had written a paper about it and we asked why do we continue prescribing drugs even in the last six months of someone's life? And I think there are multiple reasons why we do that. But the solution is to identify life, peaceful life death transition as one of the quality indicators, as one of the metrics um, equivalent to quality of life or survival and other metrics that we use. And to discourage using war as a metaphor for uh, cancer. So this was... This, these two pictures that I'm going to show will show the contrast in how patients die uh, in the past versus now. And now we are not letting anyone die peacefully. So I think there, there has also been failure of medical education to this. And because multiple studies have shown that residents, they feel that their education on, the, on this topic was inadequate. And 25% of the residents felt uncomfortable discussing end of life care with the patients. And there is very uh, less amount of time uh, dedicated for this. And consistently, from the families of dying patients, we hear that doctor-patient communication is the area that receives the most negative comments. Uh, and this is understandable because care for the caring for the dying is not empiric. There is some spiritual nuance to it. And the teachable moments are not black and white. It's very subtle and residents or the trainees will have to learn by watching the attendings or the faculty do it. Uh, and finally, uh, I'd like to end with a word on palliative care. This has been the traditional branding of palliative care about uh, mostly related to care for the dying patient. And that's why both physicians and patients, they have a negative attitude towards palliative care, early palliative care, even though it has been shown to have good outcomes for patients with cancer. Um, patients and physicians are reluctant to get referred to uh, palliative care services. And as a result of which physicians are not referring patients, patients are declining the referral, patients are not receiving palliative care, leading to poor symptom control, lack of attention to overall well-being of the patient and overuse of chemotherapy until the end of life and end of life care catastrophes. So I think palliative care needs rebranding. There is a serious need for that. And instead of branding palliative care as caring for the dying, we should rebrand palliative care as a care to you promote courage, tranquility, intimacy, dignity, and family time. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Nathan Cerny, Dr. Scott Berry, and Dr. Remy Sedam, who helped me with uh, uh, preparation of this talk. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions.